This series of webcasts expands on our introduction to the chemistry of monosaccharides. We'll still see the typical reactivity of the carbonyl and alcohol functional groups as the defining features of sugar chemistry. However, in this lesson, we'll expand by introducing the typical reactivity of the hemiacetal functionality found in all cyclic monosaccharides. Let's begin with an interesting observation about the optical activity of chiral cyclic monosaccharides. Let's imagine that we were able, through chromatographic separation or other means, to isolate only the beta anomer of D-glucose. Placing beta D-glucose in a polarimeter to measure its optical activity reveals a specific rotation value of plus 18.7 degrees. To measure optical rotation, we need to place the sugar in homogeneous solution. If we let the sugar sit for a few days in this solution and measure its optical activity again, we see a very different specific rotation value, plus 52.7 degrees. Because optical activity is directly related to the configuration of the sugar stereocenters, the change in specific rotation suggests that the pure beta anomer is undergoing conversion to some other chiral compound. Armed with only this information, we have no way of knowing what this compound is unless we separate it from the beta anomer and characterize it. We could go that route, but I want to introduce you to a simple hypothesis and another experiment that's possible here. Given what we learned about the mechanism of sugar cyclization, you might suspect that cyclic sugars can reopen to their open chain forms. Indeed, we've seen that open chain and cyclic forms are always in equilibrium with one another, meaning that cyclization must be reversible. Furthermore, it seems very easy to convert between the conformations leading to the alpha and beta anomers, all we have to do is rotate around a carbon-carbon bond. Thus, we might expect the alpha and beta anomers to be in equilibrium with one another too. And because the opening and closing processes are just rearrangements, we might expect this process to happen in solution without the need for any particularly strong external reagents. How can we prove that the change in optical activity that we see is due to isomerization of the beta to the alpha anomer? One way to test this hypothesis is to begin with a pure sample of the alpha anomer. If we place the alpha anomer in solution and let it sit for a few days, we should expect it to eventually reach the same equilibrium state, that is, the same specific rotation value that the beta anomer reached, assuming our hypothesis about equilibration of the anomers is correct. This is what's observed experimentally. The fact that the same specific rotation value results regardless of the anomer we started with, suggests that the equilibrium state is a mixture of the alpha and beta anomers. The reaction that interconverts the alpha and beta anomers is called mutarotation because it alters the optical rotation of a pure sugar. What's the mechanism of mutarotation? We've seen one possibility already. After protonation of the oxygen within the ring, beta elimination at the hemiacetal hydroxyl group produces an open chain sugar. A straightforward bond rotation exposes the opposite face of the carbonyl to nucleophilic addition, which occurs to give the opposite anomer. We call this endocyclic bond cleavage because beta elimination breaks a sigma bond within the ring. But there's another mechanism we can envision, involving protonation of a different oxygen and cleavage of a different CO bond. If, instead of protonating the oxygen within the ring, we protonate the hemiacetal hydroxyl group, a new mechanistic pathway becomes available. The endocyclic oxygen acts as an electron source here, kicking off water in a beta elimination elementary step. The resulting cation is an important intermediate called an oxocarbenium ion. Notice that although we can draw a carbocationic resonance form for this molecule, it's nicely stabilized by the adjacent oxygen atom. Additionally, its two faces are diastereotopic, and we can imagine attack on either face to form the alpha or beta anomers. We refer to this as the exocyclic bond cleavage pathway because the carbon-oxygen bond that breaks is external to the ring. Evidence for both pathways has mounted over the years. Before the end of this webcast, I'd like to ask you to compare and contrast the exocyclic and endocyclic pathways, looking for differences and potential experiments that you can use to determine exocyclic
versus endocyclic ring cleavage. In the next webcast, we'll take a more detailed look at the oxocarbenium ion intermediate we saw in the exocyclic bond cleavage mechanism.